Good afternoon, or indeed good morning, or good evening, depending on where you're joining us from all over the world. Welcome to the Promoting Geodiversity Workshop. My name is Jack Matthews, and you are coming live from the Oxford University Museum of Natural History, where you are most, most welcome. I can see we have hundreds of people joining us from across the world. Thank you for being here today. Before we get going, we have a few announcements just to let you know how everything is going to be working today. And first thing to say is we're not expecting any issues, but if you do have any connection issues, you'll see at the top of the page there is a button called reconnect. So if you have any connection problems, do click the reconnect button. Um, and that should solve most of your problems. Now, we've got 10 wonderful speakers lined up today. And if you have any questions for them, we're going to be doing our Q&A as a panel discussion at the end of each session. Do keep your questions coming in on the chat and I will put them to our speakers. It would help me greatly if when you're asking a question, rather than e introducing yourselves, as Chi Huang is doing at the moment from Ho Chi Minh City in Vietnam, you are most welcome. Um, if you could click the little circle on the right hand side, it will go red after you've typed your question. And that's a little note for me that you've asked a very important question. Also, just a reminder that today is split up into two sessions. If you have not already received your link for session two, which will start at 15.35 British summer time. Um, do make sure you register online and I will send around a link in the chat to that in a moment. And of course, we always love to hear what you're thinking about today. So if you're commenting on this event on social media, do use the hashtag promoting geodiversity. Now we'll be starting our first talk in a moment, but I want to start by saying some very special uh, thank yous for people who have helped this event along its way. The first thank yous are to the University of Oxford and Research England for funding today's event and the work which has, some of the work which has gone behind International Geodiversity Day. I'd also like to recognise the help and support of IAPG and IAG for their support in advertising and promoting this event, as well as their long-term support for the International Geodiversity Day concept, which we'll be hearing a little bit more about in the coming moments. We should also recognize the support of UNESCO, specifically the UNESCO Earth Sciences and Geohazards Risk Reduction Section. I'd like to thank specifically Christoph Oslem and all the other staff in that, this the section for all their help over the past year to get us where we are today. And we couldn't start this event without recognizing three people who have been pioneers and the driving force behind the international campaign to establish an international geodiversity day. Those are Professors Bria, Gray and Zvalinsky. We are truly grateful for all you've been doing to lead this endeavor. And at that point, we have a little bit of breaking news because I'm very pleased to say, and if I can find, we might be able to go live. This is live scenes here from the UNESCO Executive Board. You can see His Excellency, the Ambassador from China there speaking in the commission which is happening now. But earlier today, um, from Paris and around the world, delegates have been meeting and we're very pleased to say that International Geodiversity Day was approved resoundingly with more than 60 member states uh, supporting uh, the motion. It still needs to go through a small vote next week, but the highest hurdle that International Geodiversity Day needs to be established, in my view, has already been crossed. So at that point, thank you to uh, His Excellency, the Ambassador for China for joining us there. He probably doesn't know he's joining us. We'll go back to that view. And I will say that this event is all about sharing and exploring ways to use an International Geodiversity Day, which we very much hope will be established for October the 6th, 
2022 will be the first one, and then every year after that. Today's about how can we use that for public and policy engagement. And I'm very pleased to say that our first speaker is uh, Professor Murray Gray, who is joining us uh, live from the UK. And it is appropriate that Murray is our first speaker. As many of you will know, he is the man who wrote the book on geodiversity. So we're very pleased to have Murray joining us, who's going to give us our first talk on Geodiversity and International Geodiversity Day. At that point, I'm going to call up Murray's slides. There we go. And I will disappear. Thank you for joining us today, Murray, and take it away. Thank you very much, Jack. Uh, sorry. Let me... Thanks very much, Jack. Um, just to say that uh, I'm doing this talk on behalf of the of the four of us. Okay, well, the Earth is often described as uh, the third rock from the sun, and that's not a bad description actually, because it's um, it's a it's basically a large rock with a surface cover of atmosphere, oceans, and life, thirteen thousand kilometers in diameter, and hurtling round the sun at something like a hundred thousand kilometers an hour. But it's not actually a uniform rock, particularly the Earth crust has got a, a lot of diversity. And that's illustrated in this uh, slide by the a simplified version of the geology, the solid geology of Britain and Ireland, which both have a long and complex geological history. But the solid geology isn't the only bit of geodiversity. On top of that solid geology, there's a diversity of quaternary sediments, of soils, a diversity of landscapes and topography and landforms, a diversity of processes and of hydrological features. So geodiversity, which I, I um, describe as being now as being geoscientific diversity, is the variety of non-living nature something like 5,000 named minerals, hundreds of rock types, millions of fossil species, 19,000 soil types in the USA alone, a huge diversity of processes and a huge variation in topography and physical character. But how does geodiversity benefit society? Well, it does that through what's called geosystem services. And I've put up a classification here of 25 uh, ways in which geodiversity benefits society. These are classified according to the Millennium Ecosystem Assessment. Obviously, I don't have time today to talk about uh, more than a, f a small number of these. The ones shown in red, I'll just sh show you a few slides of each of these. <clears throat> so here we've got habit number six, habitat provision. On the left, we've got vegetation growing in a joint in uh, a granite outcrop in Af South Africa. And on the right hand side, we've got barnacles growing on a rock surface in the Algarve. And this has led to the idea of uh, biodiversity. The best way of uh, a good way of conserving biodiversity is to conserve geodiversity. So this is called the conserving nature stage approach. In this case, the, um, the, uh, the, the rock is the stage and the vegetation and the barnacles are the actors. So it's a metaphor of a, of a theatre, if you like. Um, this, uh, this diagram try, shows you the, uh, how, ge how biodiversity and geodiversity have changed over time. Biodiversity, mainly unicellular organisms from something like three billion years ago through to the beginning of the Phanerozoic, the Cam Cambrian explosion, as it's called, around about 540 million years ago, uh, and, and then interrupted, obviously, by extinction events. Uh, nobody's really studied the way in which geodiversity has evolved over time, but there's a, there's a surrogate for geodiversity here, which is the volume of landmass present relative to the present. And a number of uh, authors have tried to do that by this S-shaped curve. But the important point is that by the time the um, that by the time that biodiversity started to explode, about 90% of the 
geodiversity of the Earth was already in existence. So the diversity of habitats were there into which biodiversity could evolve. Number 12, construction materials. Our towns and cities are made of materials that have come out of the earth. A variety of materials, whether it's stone, steel, concrete, glass, bitumen, and so on. And the smartphone, which is in everyone's po pocket. Everyone's walking around with geodiversity in their pocket. Smartphones contain over 80% of the non-radioactive elements in the periodic table, some of which are rare and difficult to recycle. And all of those elements have come out the Earth's crust, obviously. Uh, number 17, geotourism and leisure. Here's a photograph of the Grand Canyon. It's a big canyon, but part of its attraction isn't just its size, it's its, its internal geodiversity, as you can see on the north slope of the canyon there in that photo photograph. You can see the variety of, of rock layers. You can see the variety of topography. So it's internal geodiversity that makes the Grand Canyon particularly attractive. And finally, number 21, Earth History and Geoheritage. This is an important site, Hutton's Unconformity at Sicker Point in the east of Scotland. It's a site of special scientific interest. It's a protected area, in other words. And this is where James Hutton came in 1788. And by looking at this unconformity, he realised that the Earth was much older than the 6,000 years believed at the time. In fact, we now know there's a 70 million year gap between the Devonian rocks on top and the Silurian rocks underneath. And this slide tries to explain the difference between geoheritage and geodiversity. Geoheritage, as defined by Chris Sharples, who I'll be saying a little bit about, more about later, Geoheritage is those parts of the planet's diversity that may be specifically identified as having geoconservation significance. So the reason why we chose it to call it International Geodiversity Day rather than Geoheritage Day is that geodiversity is a much wider concept and gives flexibility for people to work on this idea uh, as they think fit for their local issues. So geodiversity deserves to have an absolutely central position in the relationship between geology, geoheritage, and the other Gs. And because of that importance, four of us, as Jack has said, have been working to establish an International Geodiversity Day through UNESCO. And the four of us are listed there. There is also this website, a brilliant website that Jack's developed. And if you haven't looked at that already, you ought to. So the United Nations General Assembly and its specialised agencies, including UNESCO, can designate international days to mark important aspects for our society. And each international day is, 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 is really a springboard for raising awareness of the theme of the day among all the, all the sectors of society, including in the general public. So our first step in this um, uh, journey was to seek support from earth science and nature organizations and individuals around the world. And that quickly brought in supporting uh, letters from lots of international, regional and national organizations from all continents, as well as from several individual geoscientists. And we're still getting the letters. Now, because IUGS is an organization affiliated to UNESCO, we asked, we asked the IUGS to send the letters to UNESCO and formally request UNESCO to establish an IGD. And with the support of staff from this uh, UNESCO um, section, uh, a draft text of a future resolution was prepared together with a concept note to explain the proposal to UNESCO's member states because geodiversity isn't a well understood concept we realized that we had to A, use simple language to explain the concept and its importance, and B, demonstrate how an annual celebration of geodiversity is aligned with UNESCO's policy. So those were the two important things we had to do. And as Jack has said, the proposal has been considered by UNESCO's executive board this week and next week. And that's less than a year after the Oxford conference that kicked off the process. Now, the agenda of that um, meeting 
uh, said that the IGD proposal would be examined without debate. And in fact, the original proposals were Portugal and UK, but it's now garnered support from over, it says 50 countries here, but we're now up to 70, over 70 countries are now supporting this proposal. Um, and the agenda for that board states that the Director General welcomes the initiative in view of its role for sustainable management of the planet and its geological heritage and for human well-being. So if, as seems likely, the Executive Board supports the proposal, um, as Jack says, it was discussed this morning, but it's still got one small hurdle to overcome next week. It will then go to UNESCO's General Conference in November for final approval. And if, as seems likely, it's approved there, we can all expect to celebrate the first International Geodiversity Day on the 6th of October 2022. Why the 6th of October? Well, two reasons. First of all, we wanted a, uh, a spring or autumn date so as to allow field activities in both hemispheres. And October was the, was the month in which Chris Sharples published the first publication to use the term geodiversity in the sense it's used today and that was in October 1993. So in conclusion, our planet has an incredible and magnificent geodiversity, and this ought to be more widely understood and celebrated because it can enrich our lives and quite simply our modern society couldn't live without it. So value geodiversity every day, but particularly on IGD from 2022. And I'd just like to reiterate, finish by reiterating uh, our thanks to, to these organisations and individuals for helping us. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you to Murray for a brilliant introductory uh, talk. Just while I'm calling up the slides for Susan's uh, talk, a few little announcements. Um, those talks that we have permission from uh, the presenters will be recorded and put online and we can share those with attendees later. Do keep your uh, questions coming in. And also, if I can say, Rigoberto, who is one of our speakers today, if you are attending at the moment in the audience, um, could you go and check your email and just pop in because you need to use your special link to join us as a presenter. Um, and at this point, I'm going to, we're going to zoom across to Laurentia, um, to North America, where Susan is going to join us. Susan, can, do you want to turn your camera and microphone on? How are you doing today? Doing very well. Thank you, Jack. Excellent. Um, without further ado, I think your title is up there. I'm not going to waste any more time. Let's go straight into your brilliant talk. Thank you very much, Susan. Thank you. Jack, I, I want to appreciate uh, tell you I appreciate the opportunity to talk today. I'm going to share information about a program uh, that I hope inspires other people to see if they could do something similar in their country or where they are representing. And that is uh, taking lawmakers on field trips. This is a program that the Kansas Geological Survey has been running for 25 years now. Our focus is on geology, but it's also on the interconnection of geology with the environment, with, uh, you know, construction materials, with the economy. So with that, uh, tell you a little, whoops, let me hit the right button. First of all, since uh, I may be the only one here from Kansas, I don't know, uh, where in the world is Kansas? Since we are a state geological survey, that is where we are taking lawmakers to view. We are a smack dab in the middle of the continental United States. Uh, if you go to the slide on the left, you'll see a large yellow area that's referred to as the Great Plains. And we are lying within that eco region. It is a heavily agricultural area. I'll also mention on the left portion of the Great Plains yellow area is where the High Plains Aquifer, or also known as the Ogallala Aquifer, underlies, which is one of the world's great aquifers. And it's extremely important to an agricultural community because the western portion of the Great Plains is semi-arid or water short. And that's one of the issues that we often talk about on these geological field trips. So on the Kansas Field Conference, first I'll explain that the Kansas Geological 
Medical Survey, we are a state agency. We get money from the state government annually, but we are also part of a universe of the University of Kansas, and we are a research center. A large portion of our budget is from research grants. Importantly, we are apolitical. We cannot go and directly petition lawmakers for funding uh, ourselves. However, we can educate them. And that is a lot of what, what started us taking lawmakers out and other decision makers on an annual field trip. Uh, we visit a different region every year. Now over 25 years, we're only one state. Obviously, we're, we're traveling some of the same area every year, but there are new issues that come up. We visit new sites and there's new lawmakers and new decision makers coming in all the time. And this is a two to three day field trip. There's always two overnights with it. So it's a fair amount of time commitment for the people. We invite it's only by invitation and we invite state legislators. Now, state legislators. It's probably as it's true for most politicians, all kinds of backgrounds that they come from. Very few of them are scientists, even far rarer is to have geologists. So we're there to educate them. We are selecting people that are in leadership roles on key committees, such as on the environment or energy or transportation, or if we happen to be visiting the area that they represent. We also invite other decision makers, the agency heads of uh, environment, water, uh, transportation and wildlife. Usually there's somebody from industries, our primary utility who's involved with quite a bit, organizations that influence decisions on the environment, sometimes university bigwigs. And if there's room on the bus, we will include a school teacher as well. Importantly, we do not have journalists on the bus or any lobbyists. We do not invite them. So the, the bus itself is a lobby free zone. Now, journalists sometimes will show up at the sites and that's fine. They'll write up stories about the, what we are doing at these sites and give that legislature, legislators some uh, publicity. So why do we host? Again, it's to inform the decision makers about these natural resource issues. And we take them to places that they wouldn't have access to in many cases otherwise. We also keep them aware of the value of the state geological survey. In a number of states, the funding for that state survey has gone down. There's sort of the attitude of, haven't you figured out what the rocks are there yet? Uh, and thirdly, we want to establish and enrich the relationships. And why do people want to attend? Again, they're getting to see things they're unlikely to see otherwise. They're learning about issues that are coming before them or are before them already. We make it fun. Uh, and they too want to establish and, and enrich those relationships. I want to emphasize how important relationships are when you are trying to influence um, decision makers uh, on issues. After they've spent two or three days, fun, enjoyable days with you, uh, they, they know you, they're comfortable. If the, you know that there's a bill coming up or an issue coming up that you have some concerns about and you want to inform them, they're going to be much more receptive to talking to a friendly face, uh, if, rather than someone they've never heard from before. Uh, conversely, if they know there's an issue they need to figure out more about, we often get called about, you know, tell us what's happening with induced seismicity, those earthquakes that are being caused by um, reinjection of, of fluids underground. So it's important to know the time to establish a relationship is before it is needed. Something I want to emphasize is establishing this field conference, running it, it is very affordable. Quite honestly, the only cost to the Kansas Geological Survey is our time to organize it. Uh, even if it, if it, even if it cost us money though, and we didn't break even, we would still be running it because it is so valuable to establish those relationships and inform decision makers. We have several state agencies that help co-sponsor it. Uh, they get, uh, informed, they get, um, acknowledged on all the publication materials we do, and they get two complimentary seats on the bus. Another important factor is that we charge every participant, even the lawmakers. It is a uh, subsidized fee. It certainly doesn't reflect the, the entire cost of the trip, 
but it um, also shows their commitment. They're putting in $150 and they know all their transportation meals, field guides, everything is covered. I also often get the meals subsidized by asking the firms or industries we visit. If we're going to a railroad intermodal, for example, I might say, would you sponsor us for lunch or for dinner if we happen to be around that time? And more times than not, they're very happy to do that. Even when I'm negotiating, even when I'm setting up the hotel rooms or entrance fees, I can negotiate those. They're not free, but you know, they try to give us a reasonable price. I've mentioned seats on the bus. We travel on a single bus. Now make it a nice bus, make it a luxury bus, but it is a single bus. I could easily fill two buses. There's always a waiting list every year, but it's important that we're all together. For one thing that keeps our size to about 45 to 50 people. Also people that are on this are from all political stripes. If I had two buses, in America, half of them, the Republicans would be on one bus and the Democrats on another. I want everybody together. So we're intermingling, we're discussing, it's friendly, collegial. We also have a microphone on the bus. And if there happens to be an hour, hour and a half between sites, we'll have many, many talks on the bus. In some places I will have pick up a person at one location, they'll talk a bit on the bus, and then they jump off at another location and figure out a way to get back to their car. Um, we'll have the legislators drive to whatever location we're at, leave their, their car at the motel, and we all get on the bus. So that, that works out well. Uh, we take on hot issues, important issues, issues that, um, are going to be before them in the state house. And this happens to be at a location uh, uh, where there's a large federal reservoir that is infilling with sediment due to unstable stream bank erosion. The person speaking at the microphone there was the director of the Kansas Water Office describing their desire to start dredging it, a very expensive effort. And he would be seeking funding from the state as well as funding to stabilize stream banks. The Corps of Engineers shut down that road for us while we we're there on the dam road and talking about this issue. In Western Kansas, uh, it's a lot of agriculture and a lot of water issues. So we go and we visit the dairies that are out there. And we're also at a beef cattle feedlot discussing their water, their water quality issues, groundwater depletions, and the economics. Agriculture in western Kansas runs on water and um, extremely important. A lot of the programs we have to conserve the Ogallala Aquifer. On the north East side of our state, our boundary is defined by the Missouri River, which runs one of the, the country's major rivers in the United States. A uh, lot of issues there. Uh, the Corps of Engineers, a federal government agency, is responsible for keeping it navigable, as well as preserving habitat for endangered fish and birds. Uh, and we're having some erosion issues going underneath the bridges. So we get the legislators onto these boats, take them out, and the Corps of Engineers talks to them about some of the programs that they're running and some of the challenges. We also take them down into mines. Uh, Murray was talking about aggregate. That is one thing that we took them down into deep into this limestone mine in, uh, in Kansas to, to see where the areas are getting blasted, how that rock is taken out. You can see the conveyor belt coming up out of the mine, bringing that aggregate up. What is the issue here? That is our urban areas are expanding and we are losing the possibilities of having sufficient aggregate for construction. We also try to take them out to wild areas to really appreciate the beauty and the diversity of our state. Now, many lawmakers tend to think just in terms of jobs or the economy and We'll tie that in with understanding these are areas where our pollinators are at. In a heavy agricultural state, pollinators are extremely important. And as most of you are aware, we are losing pollinators, our insects and our birds. Uh, 
don't just drive through these areas, we put them on a hay rack ride. Recognize a lot of our lawmakers are older and not in great physical shape, so we try to avoid long walks, take them on a hay rack ride. I circled that woman that's sort of crouched up to look at whatever the speaker is talking about. That at the time was Senator Laura Kelly, and she is now the governor of the state of Kansas. So these are high level, high level um, decision makers that we have. When it fits into our route, we will stop for uh, a fun geological talk. Here we're talking about the geological history of a region and giving these decision makers a chance to fossil hunt. So they're catch, collecting uh, bryozoas, brachiopods, and crinoids, and, and they enjoyed it. As with any good field trip, we have field guides that include a list of the participants and their contact information, a map of the route that we are going. Uh, and then for each stop, we've written up a short white paper about what are the issues there. Now, with any group, you know there's going to be those that read everything and get into the details, and those are the policy wonks. That tends to be someone like me. But I've also noticed a lot of them just are looking at the pictures and where's the next stop. So we put the key facts up front with the stop number and the key facts that I want them to know. Communication is what is heard, not what is said, or in this case, what is uh read and not what is written. To select the topics, be even-handed in presenting the issues, uh, visit the sites where people wouldn't normally have access, and it's important to have the people that are directly involved with that issue speak on the issue. Make sure that the person you're having talk is, is respected uh, and not a hothead. You really want it to be some someone that can speak well on it. Make sure you visit with the presenters, know their time limit and the focus. I said the geological survey has to be apolitical, but the speakers can definitely lobby for their viewpoint. If they think having a reservoir in one area that would flood their farm is a really bad idea, they are free to say that. Also know that we can take them out and we can educate uh, our legislators on key issues, but that's only one part of politics. Um, an example is Quivera National Wildlife Refuge in our state. It is a Ramsar wetland of international importance. It has had a 30 year struggle for the wetlands senior water rights to be protected from the surrounding irrigation water rights. So this has been there for a long time. Irrigation grew up around it. It is politically heated uh, and water for farms versus water for wildlife. Well, you know, the people vote, the birds do not. So, so far, there's not been any enforcement of that, that water right. And a lawsuit which was filed in January of this year against both the federal government and the state of Kansas. And so with that, I think I'm in time. And um, I want to thank you for uh, listening to this and hope that you get ideas for how it might work in your region. That was one of the most accurately timed talks anyone has ever given. Well done, Susan. Thank you so much for joining us to present on such an important topic that we engage people, uh, particularly politicians on this topic around the world. I think I am correct in saying uh, that uh, no politician in the British Parliament has ever mentioned the word geodiversity. So maybe that's a challenge for us Brits in the audience to lobby our representatives uh, and now we have a model that we can copy. At this point I'm going to encourage you all to keep your wonderful questions coming in which we're going to put to our speakers at a Q&A session later on. We are going to keep moving west over the Pacific to the wonderful Philippines where we're going to join Joy who is going to be telling us about why we need to involve our communities in resilience. So at that point I'm going to call up Joy's wonderful presentation. Let's just check. How are you, Joy? How are you today? Hi, everyone. I'm good. Brilliant. You're coming through loud and clear. So thank you, Joy, for joining us at what must be a slightly later hour than most of our attendees. And at that point, please do take it away. Thank you. 
A pleasant day to everyone. I am Joy T. Santiago from the University of the Philippines Resilience Institute. Today, I will share with you how community science plays an integral role in disaster risk reduction management here in the Philippines. So the Philippines, due to its geographic location and topography, is exposed to various natural hazards. These hazards impose a threat to the population, to the economy, society in general. Situated in the tropics, the Philippines will inevitably suffer from climate-related calamities similar to those we have experienced in the last 10 years if disaster risk reduction and management are not significantly improved. As of 2020, the Philippines ranks ninth among the most at-risk country in the world. The Philippine government enacted various regulations and laws to address the impending adverse effects of natural disasters or natural hazards and climate change. The disaster risk reduction management in the Philippines can be dated as early as 1914, when then President Manuel L. Quezon enacted the Executive Order Number 335 to establish the National Emergency Commission. The commission implemented measures to control and coordinate civilian participation to address the crisis in the country. It was followed by the creation of the National Civil Defense Administration in 1954, the Interagency Formulation of Disaster and Calamities Plan in 1970, and the creation of the Office of Civil Defense in 1972. And then in 1978, the establishment of the highest policy-making body for disaster management in the country, the National Disaster Coordinating Council. In 2010, the NDCC was reorganized as the National Disaster Risk Reduction Management Council through the Philippine Disaster Risk Reduction Management Act of 2010. So this act aims to reinforce the national, the institutional aptitude rather of the local communities for disaster resilience. The law mandates to mainstream DRRM approach in the development plan, policy formulation, socioeconomic development planning and budgeting at various government levels. Thus, it is imperative to conduct a risk assessment that includes technical characterization of hazards, such as the location, the intensity, frequency, and probability. But is it really necessary to use probabilistic hazard maps in conducting risk assessments? According to United Nations International Strategy for Disaster Reduction, while historical losses can explain the past, they do not necessarily provide a good guide to the future. Most disasters that could happen have not happened yet. Probabilistic risk assessment simulates those future disasters which, based on scientific evidence, are likely to occur. The Climate Change Act of 2009 in the Philippines states that the local government units should be the frontline agencies in the formulation planning and implementation of climate change action in their respective areas. Meanwhile, the Philippine Disaster Risk Reduction Management Act of 2010 defines disaster risk reduction management as the systematic process of using administrative directives, organizations, and operational skills and capacities to lessen the impact of hazards and future disasters. The Housing and Land Use Regulatory Board, now the Department of Human Settlements and Urban Development here in the Philippines, released the Supplemental Guidelines in Mainstreaming Climate Change and Disaster Risks into the Comprehensive Land Use Plan of each local government units here in the Philippines in 2015. The Supplemental Guidelines aim to assess the local government units in climate and disaster risk assessment and mainstreaming its results to the land use plan. The Climate and Disaster Risk Assessment, or what we call here SIDRA, is the process of studying risks and vulnerabilities to natural hazards and climate change. 
The diagram on the screen shows the six-step process of SIDRA. So as you can see, the process is highly technical and requires a practical methodology for data collection and processing. So the, the unavailability of data, challenges in data collection, limited resources, of, limited resources to process collected data, and the complexity of the process are just some of the many reasons why most local government here in the Philippines do not have vulnerability and risk assessment. So today, I would like to show you how one local government unit uh, succeeded in the conduct of their SIDRA. So the red polygon on the center of the map is the municipality of Padre Garcia in the province of Batangas, Philippines. They engaged the University of the Philippines Resilience Institute in the preparation of their climate and disaster risk assessment. The municipality of Padre Garcia is a second-class municipality here in the Philippines. Uh, it has a total land area of 4,151 hectares and a population of around 48,302 people. Uh, it increased since 1960s and will continue to do so in the next 10 years. So the Padre Garcia, in the conduct of their climate and disaster risk assessment, used various hazard maps and employed mixed methods for data collection and analysis. The data that they were able to collect were analyzed using computer-aided hazard modeling and seed mapping. So our institute, the UP Resilience Institute, assisted the local government unit in data collection and analysis of the climate and hazard information for their locality. The second step summarizes the impacts of climate change and hazard information. It involves uh, identification of probable impacts of climate change and hazards that are likely to affect various sectors in the municipality. So the tool that we used here is the impact chain diagram. So you can see that in two of the photos in the screen. It is a significant tool for the uh, process as it's illustrate the physical, economic, social, and environmental implication of climate change and disasters in their locality. The third step is the most time-consuming and the most tedious process, which is the exposure develop, uh, development of exposure database. So for this step, uh, the LG, uh, we included detailed baseline information on the potentially exposed elements in the municipality. Uh, we assisted the local government units through various capacity building activities, such as the use of geographic information system, to collect and map spatial data. So the map that is shown on your screen is the output of the collaboration. It is the existing land utilization map or the existing land use map of the municipality. We use this input to assess the vulnerabilities and risk of each element, so of each color that you can see on the map. So we assess the vulnerabilities and risk of each element in the municipality. The fourth and the fifth step is the core step of the SIDRA process. It is the vulnerability and risk assessment. So in this process, we refer to vulnerability as the degree to which a system is susceptible or unable to cope with the adverse impact of climate change. While our risk refers to the combination of probability of occurrence of an event and the magnitude of impact. The last step is the summarization of technical findings. So it allows the local government unit to analyze the spatial development issues and concerns and enumerate the possible policy interventions to reduce the risks at a tolerable level using multi-hazard objectives or perspectives. Utilizing the results of uh, the technical findings or the vulnerability and risk assessment, the municipality of Padre Garcia identified appropriate policy interventions for their municipalities. And these interventions are mainstreamed to their local development plans. So here in the Philippines, the local government units are mandated to formulate around 30 to 50 plans. So the national government, the national government is expecting our local government units to 
mainstream the vulnerability and risk assessment into all of these plans. So in this case, I would like to show to you the uh, one of the, the video of our collaboration, one of the participatory workshop that uh, we've conducted together with the municipality of Padre Garcia in Batangas. <music> Thank you very much. Community science refers to scientific research and monitoring driven and controlled by the community and is characterized by place-based knowledge and social learning, collective action, and empowerment. Community science aims to negotiate, improve, and transform governance for stewardship and social ecological sustainability. The municipality of Padre Garcia in Batangas, Philippines, engaged with the University of the, Resili University of the Philippines Resilience Institute to conduct its, its climate and disaster risk assessment. Rooted in the inherent commitment and local values of Garcianos, their municipality, the engagement interlinks scientific and technical methods with community knowledge. In this way, it empowers the community's decision-making abilities as they formulate risk-sensitive policy interventions and local plans to address climate and hazard impacts. This experience taught me that the technical assistance from the, from the academe and the national government agencies to the local government units is very important. However, the initiative from the community is to implement disaster management efforts is equally important. Through community science, the culture of safety and preparedness is heightened in achieving a more resilient Philippines. That will be all. Thank you. Thank you so much to Joy for your wonderful, wonderful presentation and apologies once again for missing the cue to play your brilliant video. Just a reminder to everyone joining us today from around the world, hundreds and hundreds of you from all over the world. Um, with the permission of uh, speakers, we will be sharing recordings for those that we have permission of, and we will send out that information via email on the website and social media. If you have your questions, keep them coming in on the chat. And if you're joining the community and the chat online, please use hashtag promoting geodiversity. At this point, I am very pleased that we are going to zoom back across the, uh, uh, the Pacific. And that was the alarm because Joy was ahead of time. Very well done there. And we're going to zoom across the Pacific to Peru, where Rigoberto is joining us from the Volcano Observatory there. I'm going to call up his talk. Do you want to turn on your camera and microphone using the two buttons at the top of the screen of the four, the two on the left, Rigoberto? We'll just check that you're joining us loud and clear. How are you today? 
Uh, hi, everybody. Um, this is Rigoberto Aguilar from Peru. Excellent. Thank you for joining us today. At that point, we can hear you loud and clear, and I will disappear. Take it away and tell us about geoscience as a tool to promote resilience to volcanic hazards. Thank you for the presentation. Um, today, I'm going to talk about the geosites as a tool to promote resilience to volcanic hazards in Arequipa, uh, in the south of Peru. Uh, sorry, uh, because of my English, um, but I will try to, to talk uh, uh, slowly. Here in the uh, central image, we can see a picture of the Arequipa city. Uh, uh, the city of Arequipa is the uh, second uh, biggest city in Peru with approximately one million of inhabitants uh, living a close to active volcanoes. Here uh, to, the, uh, to the right, we can see the Misty Volcano, which is an active volcano uh, having a, an explosive activity, an explosive Plinian eruption uh, 2000 years ago. Uh, to the other uh, hand, in to the left, we can see the Chachani volcanic uh, complex, which is uh, composed by approximately um, 12 volcanic edifices. Uh, this is also a, a potentially active volcano close to the city of Arequipa. So that's why uh, the volcanic um, activity is very common in, in the south of Peru. Here in the images, we can see, for example, in this picture uh, to the left, Ignimbra uh, deposits, um, mostly composed by uh, rhyolitic, uh, pumice-rich uh, vol uh, volcanic rocks. And also we can see the, the city of Arequipa close to the, to the misty volcano. Arequipa was, um, nominated as a UNESCO World Heritage uh, City in, two, in the years of 2000 mm -hmm. because of the ornamented architecture uh, in the historical center of the city. Um, these uh, buildings are, uh, or, or the, the houses, the cathedral are built with volcanic rocks with uh, white uh, volcanic ignimbrite. That's why the city of Arequipa is called as the White City in Peru. Also, uh, the religious uh, celebrations uh, are uh, organized close to these uh, volcanic, out, uh, volcanic outcrops, like here close to the Rio Chile River. So uh, here in Peru, we are in a, a geological, uh, in a complex geological setting because we have uh, the contact or the subduction process uh, between the Nazca plate and South American, where Nazca plate goes beneath the South American plate. And that's why this uh, zone is very active seismically. And uh, we have also volcanoes, the central volcanic zone covers uh, south of Peru, part of Bolivia, Chile, and Argentina. Here in the south of Peru, we have uh, identified at least 10 active volcanoes, which are um, in uh, red triangles uh, from Coropuna until Casiri. And here uh, in the region of, of Arequipa, we have uh, two active volcanoes. Uh, one of them is Sabancaya, and the other one is Mist. And also to the south, we have the Ubinas volcano, which is the most active volcano in Peru. So uh, now we have a question. Where did the rock used uh, for the construction of the Arequipa come from? So um, <clears throat> that's why um, we started to, to work uh, in different projects here in the Volcano Observatory in Arequipa. To, under, to understand the, the geological history of the, the volcanoes, for example, in, and also in the Misty. So uh, I'm going to uh, show some pictures to uh, give an idea about the uh, origin of the Arequipa um, Airport Ignimbrite, which is named uh, locally as the Ciliar. The Ciliar is the uh, rock uh, used to build the, the historical center of the year. So we can go back 
1.65 million years ago in the in the city or in the area there was a big volcano uh, producing a very huge explosive activity emitting a big amount of uh, magma ash pumice and rocks to the atmosphere uh, producing a these pyroclastic uh, flows or pyroclastic density currents, which is uh, a hot and turbulent mixture of rock, gas, and ash fragments that travels rapidly from the volcanic crater, uh, as we can see here in the, in the diagram. Then, uh, because uh, of the magma chambers, uh, the magma chambers is emptied, uh, the, the weight of the uh, of the rocks um, produce the collapse, pro uh, forming a volcanic caldera. Then this volcanic caldera was filled by water. This was in three years uh, geological mapping, uh, taking samples, identifying the, the deposits of this uh, eruption. Uh, then 2000 or uh, the units produced by uh, these uh, huge eruptions are the uh, ignimbrite or the ciliar deposits of uh, these buildings. And the upper uh, the deposit is the pink uh, ignimbrite, uh, which is uh, more, more uh, fragile. Uh, it's not used for the building. And of course, there happened other processes like, like uh, lahar flow emplacements in the sun, which covered these volcanic units. Um, 1.2 million years ago, until the present, um, the, uh, the Chachani volcanic complex uh, built uh, the, the, the present state uh, we can see um, close to Arequipa, the Chachani volcanic cluster was formed after the eruption of the, uh, the Ignimbrite, uh, the Arequipa airport Ignimbrite. So um, the volcanic activity in the region was uh, present during maybe the, the last 90 million years. This, um, map, this is a geological or, or generalized uh, geological map of Chachani volcanic cluster. And here we can see the city of Arequipa. And um, each color identifies the uh, each edifice uh, composing the, the, the Chachani volcanic cl uh, cluster. Here, for example, uh, to the base, we can see this ignimbrite, which is used to build uh, the center of the city. Uh, but uh, what is uh, uh, Oho is used the, the knowledge about the geological history of a place. Here we can see a Google map uh, images uh, from 1984. And in red line, we can see the city of Arequipa. And uh, then uh, in this other image in 2021, we can see how the city of Arequipa has grown rapidly. And this may um, increase the risk uh, of uh, to volcanic uh, eruptions of Misty um, or maybe uh, to Chachani. And also around the area, we can see a different kind of deposit of explosive activity like pyroclastic uh, flow deposits on Tefra Fall uh, deposits. And also these times during the rain, most of the uh, ravines or quebradas um, are affected by lahar flows. So that's why uh, we uh, use this uh, geological information to um, teach, to uh, sensibilize to, to the people, to the population, and also to, uh, for the scientists, it, it's important. Uh, we had uh, in Peru two recent uh, eruptions in, in two volcanoes in the Ubinas in 2006 and 2013, and also the last one uh, in 2019, as we can see in this in this uh, satellite image, <clears throat> that uh, Ubinas volcano produced a huge explosion with a 6.5 uh, ash column, uh, reaching even the uh, La Paz in, in Bolivia. 
and also the Sabancaya volcano started a, a eruptive episode in 2016, uh, which is actually in activity. Here in the picture, we can see the town of Ubinas covered by ash flow produced by uh, Ubinas volcano. So that's why it's inter uh, important to study, to know the past of a place to geological history. And also we have participated or we uh, participate in the UNESCO project, the Geoheritage for Geohazard Resilience, the IGCP 692, uh, uh, identifying different uh, geosites uh, near to Arequipa. One of them is the Canteras de Sillar de Añazhuaycu, is a quarry where people extract uh, the stones to build or uh, to make some sculptures and also for the buildings. Here, um, we try to collaborate with uh, these uh, people in, in working in the quarries. No? They are called the canteros. Um, we uh, interchange uh, science and experience. We know uh, we give them the, 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 the scientific uh, part of the information, and also they uh, teach us about how they work in this um, in these quarries, how do they uh, work uh, doing these magnificent uh, sculptures. Um, we have tried uh, to to give the history of the origin of the ciliar in this uh, outcrop walls. And so the, the idea is that the, this uh, design, the history of this, uh, the, the origin of the Ignimbrite, like here, uh, as we can see in the picture. And also we are working in a, a 2D short video and also working in comics to uh, give the history of the origin of the Ignimbrite. Another part, another uh, geosite is the um, town of Yuraviejo. Uh, near to Chachani volcanic cluster, where we have uh, identified a monogenetic volcano with a lava flow deposit. Uh, we can see, for example, this, uh, this charge, and also uh, in the surrounding areas, we have uh, very nice um, sedimentary rock uh, outcrops. Uh, we uh, did a geological map explaining where the lava flows uh, are and where the crater is beneath this, the town of, of Yuraviejo. Uh, this is uh, a way how we are working, uh, doing very easy information of, to give uh, to the authorities and also to the population and doing also press uh, releases to inform uh, how the uh, geoheritage and also uh, how the geohazard can be uh, a, teach to the population and also to empower the local scientists. Uh, for example, here we can see the um, Lahar Hazard map of the Chachani volcanic cluster here in yellow. That's uh, it's the Yuraviejo town and also the Añazhuaico quarries. The idea is to uh, do a 3D um, hazard map like uh, the Misty Volcano in order to generate a simple and accessible information uh, to form resilience communities in, in Peru. And also this information can be replicated in other uh, areas uh, in Peru. So that's why uh, I wanted to say, to talk about here. It's a very nice, nice picture uh, drawn by Pablo Sanaguano with uh, local customs of the people near to Arequipa. Thank you very much. Thank you so much to Rigoberto for your talk. And as many people commented in the chat, you need not worry about your English. You came across wonderful and we could hear the uh, great items that you were talking about in your talk. So thank you for that perspective. It's important that we remember that uh, International Geodiversity Day is an important opportunity for us to save lives by increasing the knowledge of geohazards and the ways in which we can increase resilience to them. So at that point, we are going to zoom on to the final talk of session one and go over to the Caribbean where hopefully Dr. Shireen James-Williamson is joining us. How are you, Shireen? I'm well, thank you, Jack. 
wonderful and you're coming across loud and clear. Awesome. So I am going to call up your slides now. We're very interested to hear about the use of artificial and virtual reality as a tool for geoheritage awareness and resilience. Very exciting talk. Take it away, Shireen. Good afternoon, good morning um, to everyone. And um, I guess I guess my presentation is almost like a wish list. So I hope that it will be interesting and you, you can see some takeaways as we go on. So um, we've recently received funding for some additional geoheritage work um, in Jamaica from UNESCO. Um, our project is um, IGCP project. Um, 718. So I hope that I can generate some interest um, and, and at least gain some, some collaborators. So I'm going to talk a little bit about geoheritage, um, artificial intelligence, uh, um, sorry, uh, augmented reality and virtual reality. I'm going to talk about, um, just by way of examples, three of my dream sites in Jamaica, something that I'd like to see with AR and VR, and then I'll have some concluding remarks. So, um, so in terms of geoheritage, I mean, just generally, I think everybody knows what that is. Um, we're looking at sites that have geological, cultural, aesthetic, and um, cultural significance. But on top of all of that, we have the people aspect and the stories. Um, I think part of the, the, the problem these days is that there's, the, the stories are not being propagated in the way that they used to be. Um, how does it relate to awareness? Uh, uh, Rigoberto's talk basically spoke about that. The more information you have and the more connections you make with a local community and with the basic geology in that location, it provides us with, with an awareness on which to, to build our own identity, which falls in to resilience. So you can become more resilient as a result of being more aware and our geoheritage um, enhances that. Why is it significant? Well, I would ask, why is it not? Um, if you have something on which you can hinge your own existence um, and e your everyday life, um, one can basically find its significance there. So our duty um, as um, geoheritage and geological professionals uh, is, is basically to make that connection with each person in, in very different ways. And, and I suggest that AR and VR can do that and allow us to be able to, 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 be able to do that from, you know, across, across oceans, so to speak. What are some of the threats? Well, I would, in, I would say, um, as I mentioned before, storytelling is a threat. Um, in fact, uh, as I mentioned that to a colleague some time ago, um, we discovered that story listening was one of the major threats because people are telling stories. It's just that uh, we're not sitting and listening. There isn't a captive audience to hear what the stories are so that they can then form the basis of our own awareness and um, later on our own resilience. Um, another aspect is absence. And um, another threat, absence being within our geological and um, geoheritage context, this is when you have natural disasters, for example, and this is a concept that we're trying to expand because normally absence heritage is usually plugged into um, aspects of our heritage that have been removed for whatever um, political or geopolitical reason or um, just because they don't want to memorialize a particular event. But within the context of our geoheritage, a ge geological disaster may um, cause us to have gaps in our narrative and those gaps um, it, it creates problems for her, our own awareness it creates um, problems for our own resilience because of the absence of this information and so we want VR and, 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 and AR to plug that gap and give us um, give us much more of what we need um, another threat is the mechanisms for preservation um, and of course the misuse or misconception um, of what the geoheritage site is or what it means because of course it's going to take on a meaning for everybody but if um, it's only done to further maybe an economic objective then um, the community isn't served um, or at least the best interest of the community isn't served. So in terms of AR and VR um, I'm sure from the varied audience we have, we know what AR and VR is. Um, augmented reality basically is the contextualization 
of um of of a site or of um of an or, or an item or an object it provides us with um a visualization that's contextualized it's put in into context for us to appreciate what a thing is or was or can be um while on the other hand the virtual reality it gives us um a sort of a replacement of what is or what could be and as a result you're able to to use both of these visualizations to not only share in experiences but also to allow us experiences that we couldn't normally have um, if you're thinking of an of a historic site for example um, let's say somewhere in in the uk for somebody who can't travel to the uk for whatever reason especially now with um, a pandemic on our hands um, one could experience a space or a place without physically being there by virtue of of immersing in 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 the technology so so these um, visualizations allow us to 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 become more aware of each other's spaces, which then promotes um, a lot of awareness, which then gives us um, a sort of a snowball effect in its own protection. And within that context, it makes us um, it gives us knowledge that provides us with resilience. It allows us to memorialize something, and for people with similar um, similar aspects or similar um, context or similar geological histories, it provides us with a collective memory of, of, of how we see this event or how we can appreciate the event or even how we can celebrate um, so to speak, something. And, and celebration um, may be a strong word if you're thinking of a natural disaster, but if you can also think of um, positives that can come from um, any historic situation that you can memorialize together across the globe as we are doing for geodiversity today um, and of course we can use it for study so um, there have been projects for example um, and i'll show you a project in a moment that um, that persons have been able to do geological mapping for example and appreciate what um, various geological layers and 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 fossils and and other visualizations um, um, students have been able to use this without physically going to a location. So it allows us so many opportunities, particularly now where students are more or less confined to um, a desk in their living room somewhere, um, trying to study geology, which is such a hands-on physical subject. Um, and heritage and history, where you want it to come alive, you need things like AR and VR to help with that. So here is a hodgepodge of things. And the reason I've put all of these on one slide is not only to bother you, but also to, to point to, to the fact that there, it is varied, it is diverse, it is the, the way we use VR and AR it is so diverse that you can't possibly um, encompass all of it or study all of it or be able to use all of it. So one of the things I have here is the Erasmus project, which is um, a, a project across Europe and the United Kingdom. And students have been able to do these, use these as visualizations for mapping. And it's amazing when you watch these video clips um, to see what students have been doing and how their lecturers are able to engage them in geology. It a student in Portsmouth can be able to, to utilize material from Ethiopia, for example, and be able to understand the geology of that location. Acidification of, um, of ocean water has been done by um, Stanford University using virtual reality. Can you imagine teaching about climate change or at least getting some, somebody to appreciate coral bleaching by using virtual reality or augmented reality, showing snapshots through time? Imagine going to, to Rome or um, Greece or somewhere and holding up your device when you hear a little ting on your, um, on your, your mobile phone and you're able to, to visualize what, what what a monument would look like. One of the things that have been utilizing, um, one of the programs that have been utilizing this particular um, 
technology is the Drain the Ocean series that, um, that's on National Geographic. And I have the Titanic up in the top um, right-hand corner um, because it's always so fascinating to see how they've used animation and virtual reality to immerse us into such a tremendous um, point of history. They've also used it for visualizations of Port Royal in Jamaica, and they've used it as well for visualizations um, of World War II, you know? So it, it, it gives us this idea of how we can see things. We don't have to dive to the depths of the ocean to see this because the experts have done that. And what they've done is given us this enhancement, this awareness, this snapshot of history that we weren't there, but we can engage in it in the here and now. So um, some of the benefits, the one I'd like to point out specifically is that we can then utilize this kind of platform to even further our information. So if you have a place, let's say um, on, on the right, on the left here, we have a, a GIS map of Zagreb. Let's say somebody went to this location and did their geo tour. Um, a person could have images that they've taken of something similar or somewhere else, or maybe um, something that's happening in the area. They could feed that into um, a larger body of information. So you can use it to, to crowdsource images of, of deterioration of a site. It could be of issues, maybe of somebody even doing something naughty. But the, the, the fact is that it allows us to be able to be immersed into um, an experience um, like no other, I would, you know, it's very cliche, but it really is. And it allows us to change our view or perception of a thing um, just by viewing it. Um, I remember using a view master when I was small and you could see places far away. Imagine seeing those places come to life um, for our population today. So um, I'm going to show you the Jamaican cases and I'll try to be quick because I'm sure I'm, I'm, I'm almost out of time. So Jamaica is in the, um, we're in the Caribbean, we're the third largest island, we're um, in, the, in the Greater Antilles, we're south of the US, east of um, Central America, north of South America. So we're kind of right in the middle, right? And um, I wanted to show this because we are littered with earthquakes um, because of our tectonic situation. So I, I always have to show this because our project is based on earthquakes. But, you know, it just gives you an idea of what we need to protect and why we need to protect it, because one day we could get a big shake and we've lost it all. So this is the geological map of Jamaica. And I wanted to show this as well, because as diverse as you can see all the geology on here is as diverse as our geoheritage is. And so it, 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 it is necessary for us to be able to connect into a lot of this. So I only have a few minutes left. So I'm going to show you real quick. Um, Port Royal is one area we want to look at. And here is the coastline before the 1692 earthquake. And all of this land fell into the sea. This is the coastline after the earthquake. And then there was accretion up until this is the 1960s. This is interesting and important because it tells you about geology, but it adds on top of that the story of Port Royal and the underwater city. And we would want to be able to see something like this visualized using AR or VR for somebody who can't dive or somebody who won't dive or, you know, somebody that's in, in the UK or in the Philippines or somewhere. They could immerse themselves into this virtual space and be able to see what a sunken city or the sunken city look like. And there is a documentary um, from National Geographic that you can always view. But it, it would be very interesting to see all of this and be able to walk through Port Royal, you know, um, using VR or, or AR. This is Kingston. Um, this picture is Kingston around 1902. Um, and this is Kingston 1907 when we had the earthquake. Uh, and everything in, within a particular um, apex was um, destroyed by fire. So imagine walking down, and this is the same view. This is a closer up view. This is a view from further afield, which is about the same view of here and here. Imagine being able to 
stand on the side of the road with your device up and be able to see what that street looked like right after the earthquake. What tremendous experience that would be for somebody who's learning about earthquakes and the destructiveness of an earthquake, but also to see the resilience within the context of the rebuild and all the buildings that existed then and how they've been preserved into the future. And just to be able to, to stand in one place and, and recognize that the tram was here and the tram burnt all the way through um, because of the fire associated with the earthquake. And last but not least, this is Colbeck Castle. And I did a lot of work at Colbeck Castle looking at mortar and, and all and looking at building stone. And when you look at the visualization prepared here by Peter Dunn, um, you can see how majestic this, this thing was. Imagine uh, a, a student um, from maybe primary school or high school student doing history and going on a field trip and holding up their little device. And what they see is not just the ruin, but they're seeing the majestic structure that was Colbeck Castle. Um, it, it just draws you into a tremendous experience. And so one of the things that VR does, other than it gives you that awe feeling that tells you that this thing was awesome and, and it draws you into the experience of the day. So I put this here so you can see the entire stately view of the estate, but also to show you where it exists on the map and to point out that a lot of the geology in that area was put into this building. So not only was the, the um, aggregate for the mortar for the um for the mortar found in these streams and my experiments indicate that, but it also told us where the streams drained and where the material um, for that stream came from in terms of the unroofing of the inlier, um, which is which is several miles away. So all of this information feeds into our geoheritage and gives us that experience. So yes, I'm wrapping it up. <laughs> um, so what about, I've, I've mentioned a lot of this in, in the talks. So I'm not going to go through it again, but certainly we want AR and VR to give us that connection, that tour, that, that, that link into what society needs in order to own a particular site, in order to own the geoheritage, because it is through ownership of these spaces and places that we will be able to preserve them. We also want people to, if we have, if we start from small children all the way through, what we will be doing is building a resilience through awareness from young populations. So when they become older, they will have these values. So we have to ensure that we continue with the storytelling and we continue with the story listening because the geoheritage is not geoheritage without that dovetailing of the story and the people and all that it encompasses. So what we want is for us to use AR and VR as tools on our journey towards becoming a more resilient and aware people. So when we become resilient, it means that all the knowledge and skills we've pumped into, you know, our geoheritage knowledge network, it reduces the fear of the hazard or the issue or the problem and increases our confidence. And so as we become more and more confident about our environment and, and we become more and more confident about our history and heritage, we develop an identity and that identity is rooted with confidence um, that will bring us um, in, into our own knowledge. So this brings me to the end, um, I just want to acknowledge the University of the West Indies for funding a lot of the, um, the work from Colbeck Castle and, of course, for UNESCO for our current project, um, IGCP um, 718, and to my research assistants, Georgia and, and Stephanie, for all of the work that they've, they've done with me over the last several years. Thank you. Thank you so much to Shireen. I know that from the chat that the audience will agree with me when I say that was a fascinating and inspiring talk. Um, and I think it really puts the international in International Geodiversity Day because you're showing us a way that we can bring the world together and share geological heritage um, easily in an immersive way all around the world. So thank you so much for that fascinating talk. Now, you won't, it won't have uh, passed you that um, due to my overly verbose 
uh, introduction, we have gone over time. Um, my fault, nothing to do with the speakers. Um, what I'm going to propose is that we do questions up to just past half past. So we'll still have a few minutes before we get going um, on session two to get a cup of tea and then we will start session two. So at this point, I'm going to encourage all the speakers to turn their camera on and we're going to do some quick fire Q&A because I think it's important um, that we make this as interactive with our audience who are in the hundreds um, as we can within in these times when we are separated. So I'm going to go first to Susan because there are quite a few questions to you about the um, specifics of your trip. So would you like to tell us, um, do other geological surveys in America also do these trips? Um, and um, what kinds of challenges do you face in encouraging policymakers to actually join you on the bus? Good questions. Um, and the answer is that we got inspired by a geological field trip that Colorado used to run. But uh, Colorado's geological survey, along with another number of other state geological surveys, have had serious budget cuts. Uh, and uh, they, as far as I know, no other state geological survey runs similar trips. There has been others that have been interested in it. Um, and uh, even um, some organizations such as the Geological Society of America has expressed interest that they've assumed it's been too expensive. And that's where I wanted to emphasize how it really is not expensive. Um, and to in encourage different lawmakers to come, I and the director of the Geological Survey will often go and visit directly with lawmakers if they're new. Um, there's a lot of word of mouth. In fact, I've had lawmakers <laughs> call me even before they get the invitation that they want to be invited, that they've heard this is like the best part of being a legislator because it's sort of like their summer camp, if you will. So, you know, you make it fun. The evenings, we allow drinks. There's drinks provided. So it's a really a casual evening um, as well. So they, you know, it's a lot of fun for them. And we do get them from all the different political backgrounds. There you go. The word from Susan is build it and they will come. Inspiration to us all. Um, a question specifically to Rigoberto, but other people might like to join in on this. And um, it's a topic we might get onto more in the next session as well. Um, do you think there are different needs in the way that you communicate? To For example, now we are working to translate uh, the, the short videos to Quechua because old people living in the rural areas they don't speak Spanish. So the perspective, the perception of the risk may be a different uh, in different languages. So that's, uh, I think it's very, very important, this, this topic. Joy, this, is this something, would you agree with that from your perspective in, in working with communities in the Philippines? Yes, yes. Uh, here in the Philippines, uh, communities are very participative, but there are some challenges uh, when we introduce them scientific information. Um, but it's very important that uh, we immerse ourselves as scientists to the local communities and to understand where they are coming from so that uh, we can have a very good engagement and uh, we, can, uh, allow, we can have an interlink we can interlink scientific information and science-based information to the formulation of uh, risk-sensitive policy information policies in their uh, local communities. And Shireen, you talked about using uh, new technology. We had a question about how hard is it to make these uh, virtual reality and augmented reality representations of, of geological heritage? Well, for an experienced user of the various software, it, it's a cinch. But for, um, for novices, I believe somebody like me who, um, I just, I just create what I want in my head and toss it to an expert. But, um, generally it's not very difficult. Um, because once you have the content, it's a matter of putting that content into, um, an electronic space. Um, if you can imagine, um, back a few, I think a few years ago, people were actively doing Pokemon Go. 
and they were engrossed in doing this. Essentially, all we would be doing is making, instead of a Pokemon um, image, making geologists, if you look at some of the memes going out today, um, a lot of young people are immersed in this kind of technology. And so I believe if we were able to group them all together and, and give them tasks, this would be a simple challenge for them to take on and be able to find something that is robust enough for everybody to use. Thank you, Shireen. And uh, I look forward to you releasing an app, Geodiversity Go. I'm sure we'll all download it. Um, just to wrap it up, because I'm conscious of time and starting the, the next session, apologies for the shortness of the q and I'd just like to ask uh, Murray, we had a question from our colleagues joining us in India about the uh, they were conscious that they need more legislation to protect geosites. Uh, do you have any short guiding remarks about where you would start in, in making sure that your geoheritage is protected? Where should one start? A big question with only a small answer time. <laughs> well, I think, um, I think that the establishment of an international geodiversity day um, is, is a, it will be a huge bonus. Um, because it's 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 it, it works as a as a trickle down system. In other words, if the international community is prepared to back um, an international day for geodiversity, then each country can go to their own lawmakers and say, "Look, the international community is recognising this. The United Nations, you know, UNESCO is recognising this. You need to do something in terms of." Um, uh, developing legislation for our for our own country, yeah. and then it trickles down from there. Excellent. On that note, I'm very conscious of time. I want to thank our five brilliant speakers um, for their wonderful presentations and their responses to the Q and A. I would apologise to all those in the audience whose questions didn't get asked, but maybe. Uh, put them in the chat of the next session um, and maybe our speakers might be able to join us there and answer them in the chat or indeed don't hesitate to contact you, you, our speakers and um, perhaps via point. Uh, thank you once more for joining us and we will see you shortly after a quick cup of tea in just two moments in session two.